Hey, this is Doug Sandler, host of the Nice Guys on Business podcast and author of Nice Guys Finish First. I'm hanging out with Dov Barron today. This was great. I can't believe he actually had me on his show, but we're going to give you some great secrets, great tips today on how to be a better leader and actually how to be a really nice guy and make a lot of money at it too. So stay tuned. Dov Barron right here. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us here on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series, where today we'll look at whether it's actually true that you have got to be tough, hard-edged, and maybe even a little ruthless to make it in business today. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. If you're a regular, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We're honored and grateful to have been cited by Inc. Magazine as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And GNA cited us as in the top 10 podcast for HR pros and managers. So thank you for sharing the show with everyone that you know. Remember, we always need your help. So please go over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show because it keeps us relevant and we need you there. All right. So let's strip it down and dive right in. Watching and listening to this show, you're either a high-level executive, an entrepreneur, a sales leader, or a leader in some capacity. And as a leader in any of those forms, you have no doubt been faced with business or business personal situations, and maybe even those who've led you, demanding that you toughen up. Even if you look a bit like an asshole, well, saying things to you like, well, this is business. Being a nice guy doesn't work. You'll end up finishing last. But is that true? Well, our guest today says it's a big, fat lie. And he should know because he's the author of the best-selling book, Nice Guys Finish First. Doug Sandler has over 30 years of business experience as an entrepreneur and a leader. His book, Nice Guys Finish First, is ranked number one as an Amazon bestseller. Doug is a fellow podcaster who has also made that list of the Inc. top 12 podcasts you must listen to in order to be a better leader, and I would highly recommend it. I don't know. He's had great guests on there, people like Gary Vaynerchuk, Ariana Huffington of the Huffington Post, uh, Dan Harris from Good Morning America, Ron Klain. Um, yeah, I don't think he's had uh, spicy yet, uh, but Ron Klain, who is the New York, who is the uh, White House Chief of Staff, dozen celebrities, and he even had some weird guy on with a wicked, strange accent. I can't remember his name. Let me think now. Dun, Don, Don, I don't know. It's, it's some weird name. Anyway, uh, oh yeah, Dolph Baron, that's the guy, yeah. Um, Doug specializes in teaching others how to and builds relationships and strengthening connections. Doug, Doug is a nationally recognized speaker and writer. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your fat hands together and welcome Doug Sandler. Woo! The crowd goes wild. Hey, wait, Come you on. have your own sound effects, Doug? That's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so wait, am I allowed to curse on this? They're still giving you applause. I can't shut Dub, up, it, Doug. Dub, where did you get the crowd? I don't have a crowd on my show. Where oh, did you get yours? I'm behind this wall. Man. They're all, <laughs> all right there. But, you know, I was a nice guy. Got to stand up and, and cheer for the nice guy. Hey, man, I appreciate having you having me on the show. And, you know, now I know at least one of the people because I think I hit number four on that list from uh, from Inc. Magazine. Now I know that you're at least in the one number one spot. So I, I got three more guys to climb over before I get to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you can do it because your show is awesome and you've got a massive, massive following on that show. And it's, it's a really great show. And I do highly Thanks, recommend it. Thank so, you. So, Thank you so much. So let's, let's let's jump in here. We're talking about nice guys finish first. And of course, we all know the adage, nice guys finish last. And I'm going to go right for the jugular on this one because 
politically right now, and I know we're not supposed to go political, but this is me and I do. So politically right now, there's a pretty strong argument that to win, you've got to kind of be a bit mean. You've got to go for some nastiness. Give us an example of a nice guy, nice gal, who finishes first, because right now, they're not so nice guys are finishing first. Oh, well, I guess it just depends on who's the loudest. You know, so if the asshole that's in office is loudest, then he's going to be the one that's going to get the position, all right? And and that isn't a political statement. That's just the reality of it. If he's going to lead through intimidation, which I think is – and again, we won't have to get political here. No, and and, 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 I, and I, have, I have no qualms in telling you that I didn't vote for the guy. But I can tell you that, hey, he's in position. Let's support him and let's see what he does that's right. Sure. I don't happen to believe in some of the ways, the tactics that he goes through in order to get what he wants through intimidation and through fear. But, you know, if it works for him, great. I have to go to, to bed being able to sleep with myself at night. So for me, that specific tactic wouldn't work. But you got a guy like um, like Gary Kelly. Uh, he's the uh, the CEO of uh, of Southwest. I think that it, that's his name. And Tony Shea, who's the uh, the the founder of Zappos. Yep. And um, and uh, you know, there's many. Uh, Richard Branson from Virgin. Uh, there's so many examples of guys that are in our industries that are extremely nice, extremely positive, build a positive culture. And are on the winning side. So I would say, if there's any examples, uh, yeah, maybe the loud guys are the ones that are that are showing the intimidation factors working. But that's not what I do. But 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 let's go to that because you know that's the other sort of presupposition about nice guys is that they're not loud. You know that nice guys are quiet and meek and humble and all those kinds of things. Um, and I. I personally think that's an illusion, but, you know, you're saying the ones who are the loudest, and certainly, you know, we see a lot of these uh, dominant uh, leaders who are loud, who are aggressive and intimidating, um, are not the nice guys. So, is it... How do we get the nice guys to speak up, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, I don't, and I don't even know, Dov, if we need to speak up. I think that good communicators, as you and I both know, good communicators are amazing listeners. you got a guy like Ron Shapiro, who is probably one of the foremost um, uh, um, athletic agents that's out there and an attorney. And he talks about winning through uh, winning negotiations through being nice. The Power of Nice is a book that he wrote. Mm -hmm. And what's so great about it is you don't have to be the loudest. It's the loudest ones that we hear. But the loudest ones are also the ones that are sometimes making the biggest you know, jerks out of themselves. I, I think that oftentimes there is a confusion that that nice is, is a sign of weakness yeah. and that why, and, and, and anything other than that is the reality. And that uh, you don't have to be quiet to be not nice. I mean, or, or to be nice. You can be a loud, I'm a loud guy. I mean, I believe me, my show is, I, I'm looking at 350 episodes of my show. I think only two of them had non-explicit ratings on the show. I'm loud. I'm obnoxious. I'm everything that you probably would think that an intimidating guy might be. But, I, you know, I really do feel like I'm a nice guy. I show empathy. I show compassion. Uh, but I'm a valuable leader. I'm a good leader to my team. And I feel like those are all traits that somebody that is nice actually is able to fulfill. I think you're making some great points here, Doug, because I think we've got to sort of pick it apart. Because right. I think nice guy and asshole are these massive umbrellas. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of stuff gets shoved under a particular bank that's not particularly real true about that group. So for instance, well, let nice me, guys let me, are supposed to be quiet, as you said. Let me say this though. I, I think that I think that that being nice and being an asshole are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> I think I think you could be a nice guy and still be a pain in the ass to people or obnoxious and a jerk. I think that some people choose to be nice in an environment where it's um, where they're selective about their nice. And I don't think that that's nice and being genuine. I think nice people in general are genuine people, not nice so that you can get what you want. See, I don't go. Th that's I'm the not, key yeah. that I think yeah. that people have got to get. See, I have an acronym for nice. Neurotic, insecure, controlling your emotions. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, like I have no Can interest. I, in, I got to write that down. <laughs> yeah, I have no interest in being nice. I have no interest in being fine either. Fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Right? <laughs> I don't want either of those things. Um, but I think that the the nice is often a fake 
you know? Right. And I don't, I know from your book, that's not what you're talking about. We're not talking about this, this um, presentation of nice, but rather the genuosity, the, the authenticity of nice. And so let's, let's, because I think this is important. We've got to do this purely because of what you're putting forward here. Let's refine what does nice mean in the context of Doug Sandler and your book. What, what does oh, nice good. mean as opposed to, oh, I'm good, I'm nice, I'm fine. Right. Yeah, and I want right. to punch you in the head too because you're fake. Right. right. So right. tell us what it means in your context. So I came up with this program because that question gets asked to me all the time. So instead of defining the word nice, I talk about the actions that we need in order to display what does nice exactly mean. And maybe nice is to a certain degree means responsible. I I, I don't really know. Maybe my definition, you know, Gary Shandling said, um, uh, and and I use it in my book on on the first chapter, if you don't know who, uh, if you don't know what nice is, then you don't, wait, if you think nice guys finish last, then you don't know where the finish line is. And part of the problem Hey, hey, hey. Some- whoa, 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 whoa. That was good. Say that again slowly because I think people need to hear that. Okay. If you don't think nice guys finish first, then you don't know where the finish line is. That is a great line. That's Gary Shandling? That, well, I, I, at least that's what I quote him as. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm hoping. I did some fact checking well, on that. It's if interesting because know- Gary Shandling as a comedian never came across as a nice guy. So that's, that's really – that's a fascinating piece. But I think what his persona maybe in, 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 the, in the public's perception was that he was maybe not a nice guy, but behind the scenes he was known as a masterful negotiator and a masterfully nice guy. Right. So the problem is that most people don't realize some of the skill set that is required to being nice. So I, I translate nice to being somebody that's dependable, reliable, trustworthy. So I came up with this program. It's a really simple five-step program. It literally means returning your phone calls, returning your emails, being on time every time, not over-promising and under-delivering, but just the opposite, exceeding expectations, and reaching out to people that you haven't communicated with on a routine basis just to say hi. Those five things embody, in my mind, what it means in order to be a nice guy in business. On the other side of it, I want to be able to go to sleep, put my head at the pill- on my pillow at night, and know that I've done something to make this world a better place through the course of my actions through the day. So for me, that's my personal goal every day. I want people to feel better about themselves after they left me than before they met me. Yes. People that aren't genuine don't give a shit about that. And, no. and for me, it's all about what, it's all about me, 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 me. And for me, it's about, yeah, I want to be able to achieve the goals that I have set for myself in the course of my day. But the reality of it is, and we all know this, Dov, and I know you live this practice every day because I've known you for, you know, about a year now. And I've seen this happen with you is that the way you get what you want is by helping many other people get what they want. And that's not a bad way to go through life, I think. Yeah, well, as Zig Ziglar said, you know, if you want to reach your dreams, help other people reach theirs. Totally true. Totally true. Agreed. But, you know, so I think it's important that we've done that, that we've clarified that nice is not is not what most people think it is. You know, when I first moved to North America uh, the first time, I was 21. Uh, and I <laughs> I'd, I'd arrived here, I'd, I'd been brought up in the, in the UK and I arrived here and I was like, oh, this place is so great. Everybody's like, you know, hi, good morning. You know, like, wow, you know, not where I right. come from. And and I remember writing about it to back, writing home and uh, back to the UK, not which is not home anymore, but back to where I was from and saying, you know, how friendly people were. And then writing in my journal about a year later, oh, my God, these people are full of shit. <laughs> because it was just that plastic smiley right. face version, which was inauthentic and it was very different. And and, um, and I spent some time in New York and that was what made me realize New York wasn't like that. New York was very real. I mean, they'd smile and they'd say hi. And I find New York to be extremely friendly, by the way. Um, but it wasn't that plastic version of, of in quote unquote nice. And so I think this is a really important piece that nice – you know, in, in the way that you and I would refer to it, is about being real, genuine, and authentic. And sometimes that means, yeah, you've got to deliver some shitty news, but you don't have to deliver it as an asshole. And I think that that's the distinction. Well, on the other side of it is too, and I think you hit on it, and just to make it even even more precise, it's not a veneer. It's actually how you are. 
And if, exactly. if that's the real you, then that's the real you. If you're not a nice person by nature and generally a nice person, you have one or two choices, either get nice or, or don't, or, you know, if you decide not to get nice, just no, just don't call yourself a nice person. Don't, yeah. don't put yourself in that category. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because some people want to be called nice. They want to be a nice person, but they're not. And, and other people don't want to be nice because they see it as a weakness. Right. You know, it's right. very interesting to me because um, <clears throat> a lot of it, as you said, is a veneer, it's a facade, but it's not really the truth of who a person is. Um, one of my guests on my show a while back now uh, was Itzhak Kamil, who is a mm -hmm. phenomenal guy, uh, best-selling author, international speaker, shared the stage with Branson and many others. Uh, but in his previous life, uh, he was a lawyer. In his previous career, he was a lawyer in Israel, and he did a lot of business with Trump. And so he was in the in the room negotiating with Trump, and he said, you know, Trump is vicious. He will go for the jugular in his negotiations, hence the art of the negotiation, right? Um, he says, but when he finishes, even though he's ripped your throat out, he wants to hug you. <laughs> and I said, wow, that's really fascinating to me. We, him and I were having a conversation about this. Completely nothing to do with this. This is in person. We're having a conversation about it. And, and I said, <clears throat> so what's real? Right. And, and he said to me, he says, in my opinion, what's real is that he's ruthless and he wants to win, but he wants to be liked. Yeah. And I went, that is it. That's that piece. Well, so, the piece is that, that, that he wants to be liked is that insecurity. It's that part of that in that message that you have, the nice, what is the I in there? It's the insecurity side right. of things. And, and that is not, for me, that's, that's the veneer. And you need to be able to go beyond that veneer. Right. Uh, if, that's, if this is the skill set that you want to be able to use, being ruthless, don't put that nice veneer on because you're no. just, people are going to see you as fake. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if you, I'm fully, you know, I wrote a piece on this and you may have seen it a, a while back which is, um, I, I said, you know, we think of authentic because that's the new key trendy word and I've been talking about it for 20 plus years, but we think of it as being a good thing, a nice thing, you know, um, and I said, listen, and I said in the article, you know, Hitler was very authentic. Saddam Hussein was very authentic. Mussolini was very authentic. So, uh, you know, uh, you can name all these shitty icons as they were authentic. What does it mean? It means that they were integral. They were right. truthful. They stepped up. They, they fulfilled what it is they said they were going to do. Do I want that in my life? No. Do I want to be that in my life? No. But that authenticity is, is the congruous behavior between who I am and what I do. And if you do the other way around, which is now I'm going to rip your throat and then I want to hug you. Yeah, you know uh, what? You ain't getting a hug from me because I don't trust you. And, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. But at the same time, if you're... If you're somebody who rips the throat, I might go, you're an asshole, but at least I trust you because I know you're congruent. Right. So right. I, I love that we are, I think this is a very important piece that we are refining this understanding of nice in a very different way than our listener, our viewer might see it. So tell us, why did you decide to, to, to write this book, Nice Guys Finish First? Uh, you know, what, what was the impetus to write it? So origin originally the impetus was that I had a uh, I had a career that I needed to get off the ground and <laughs> and I, I I mean I, I'll be can't it can't be any more honest than that I uh, uh, about five years ago I went through a, an entire life change um, I at forty seven years old you I decided discovered. To become a man? Yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say I didn't say I was a woman. Oh, you said life change. I'm just you know, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, we're in the yeah, well, transgender maybe, area. So just I like, never oh. never really thought of that. I think I've always been a man. I'm pretty sure. Okay, but at just 40 checking. at 47, I took an entertainment career of 30 years as a as a guy that's uh, that's out at events and hosting events and and running events and playing music at events. And I said, you know, I'm looking at my competition who's 20 years my junior, and I, and my financial planner and I discovered that. Hey, I've been in this business for 30 years. I need to figure out: Do I want to continue this? And if I'm looking five or 10 years down the road, can I want? Do I really want to be that guy that's doing my business? Right. And and uh, and I didn't like the picture that I saw. Right. So he said, "I don't know what you're going to do, but just be looking for that opportunity." So about six months later, I was at a conference and I saw a guy. His name is Ryan Estes, who is actually going to be a guest on my Nice Guys on Business podcast in the next week or so. I saw him on stage develop delivering a message about change. 
And it wasn't the message that he was delivering, but the way that he was delivering. And at the end, I think I was in the back, far back of the room. I must have run up to him and he basically said, you're not coming up here to ask me about my message. You're going to ask me how to become a professional speaker. And that was exactly what I was there to do. He said, I can't tell you how to become a professional speaker, but I can tell you I hired a coach in order to do that. Her name is Jane Atkinson. I was on the phone with Jane a couple of weeks later, hired her. Jane said, you have to write a book. So the long way to answer your question is the book came as a result of trying to uh, create this level of expertise as a professional speaker and somebody that knows about customer service, taking the 30 years of business experience that I had, putting it in a book and using that book as my platform to speak. So that's why I wrote the book. The book, though, is not just a two-year-old book. The book is 30 years of my experience of that I decided in 20, you know, in 20 weeks I had to write this book. So that's why it came out. So you say 30 years of, of business experience, okay? Um, but show us the correlation because we go, we sure. go you, were, you, were, you were DJ Doug and, right. and, and now you're the business guy it doesn't make sense to most people. Well, and it totally doesn't make sense because people, when they hear this this guy, hey, he was a mobile DJ. I was in a mo I was a mobile DJ uh, making four to six thousand dollars for a four hour gig in an environment that most people get three to five hundred dollars in. So how was I able to do that? So you I were doing that, you were doing ten times, ten times, and working a hundred times a year. So wow. for me. For me, it was a matter of translating all of that stuff that I did in my mobile DJ business, making 10 times more than what my average competition would make and putting that into the business world. So what did that mean? It meant that I wasn't showing up just playing music for four hours in an event. It meant I was building a relationship for a year and a half with that client, getting other clients from them and referral sources from them, helping them build their event. Their event that not only they weren't they weren't spending a thousand dollars on their event, they're spending fifty to a hundred thousand dollars on their event. And I was just a component of that event. Sure. So for me, it was all of the business philosophies, the principles that I learned, returning my phone calls, being a nice guy, telling the truth, being on time to my appointments, showing up, being professional, playing sick, playing hurt, all of the things that we do as professional speakers, as we do as leadership consultants, as we do as HVAC repair people, whatever it is that we do for a living, unless you give it 150%, then why do it at all? So I took all of that experience. So it doesn't translate necessarily into the how does being a DJ translate into being a professional speaker? That doesn't. But what does is all of the business, all of the other stuff that made up that business is really where what it's all about for me. Yeah. You know, I think that very often we and it's often a mistake. I mean, you know, this podcast is number one for Fortune 500. And, and so often, my guests are not from that world. You know, and, and I say, it, this is why it's important. Because business slash leadership is not limited to the corporate environment. You know, totally you, right. You, know, you took your skill set from what you learned about how to take care of your customers in such a way that, that you know, you're working 100 times a year at 10 times the, the, the standard. And how does that translate? Because that's something that every one of us needs to understand in a leadership position. So, so let's, let's take that right now sure. um, and, and jump into that. What's the most practical thing about being a nice guy and, and you know, in the context of where you're, you're coming from, what's the most practical thing about that, that you would want a C-suite individual to embrace? What is it that they can take from this more than anything as somebody who is the CMO, the CIO, the CFO, the CEO, whatever it might be? So the best thing that I could give you is advice. It would be one word. It's a one word advice and that is perspective. It's understanding the perspective of everyone that you're communicating with, whether it's the frontline staffer from your organization and you're a CEO, you have to understand what your frontline is going through, or whether you're a, you understand the perspective of your customers. Every touch point that you have with your customers is an opportunity to, to put your brand in front of your customer. And if they're, if you're a, a brick and mortar shop, and you uh, have a parking lot that's filled with garbage, or your bathroom has a trash can that's overflowing, and you're paying somebody 12 bucks an hour to clean that bathroom, and they're doing a shitty job cleaning the bathroom, you either gotta get a new person to clean that bathroom, or you have to pay somebody more to do that, or you have to do it yourself. 
Right. So all of the things that are involved, if you understand the perspective of everybody that is your, that you're dealing with in your world is your customer. And it's not the other way around. You are not leading them. They are guiding you. They, you are, they are helping you build your organization. And as long as you understand the perspective, I think it's critical. Say that again, though. You're not leading them. They're guiding you. Yeah, I think that They're, that's where it's got to stop. That's where we've got to get people to grasp. Because I think that this is one of the great challenges of leadership out of dominance and out of command and control of the old school of leadership that we've known is I'm leading them. This is how we are going to do it as opposed to guide me. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm the leader and I'm the one who's going to make the decisions. But you know what? Can't do it without your guidance, without your perspective, without your feedback. You know, so... You know, very often I've been asked this on, on many interviews myself. And as you know, I do, you know, I'm interviewed three times a week at least, you know. Um, and people will say to me, um, but you work with these, these Fortune 100, whatever it might be, Fortune 500 groups. Why would they listen to you? You've never been a CEO of a Fortune 500. And I go, absolutely not. Never will be. Not interested in it. Simple as that. And they go, well, why would they listen to you? Because I have an objectivity they'll never have. Right. And right. the and as you're talking about the person who empties the garbage can has a perspective, has an insight that you as the CEO will never have. And it's interesting because even if you look at um, people who've come up through the la uh, through through the ranks, very often they've lost the perspective. It's fascinating yeah, you, to me. Like you have to I've keep gone from being a, sh a floor worker and now I'm the the CFO. And have lost perspective. It's fascinating. They need that guidance. You have to. You have to be able to be open to the possibility that there is other than just the way that you want to lead them. It, it is all about the front line. It's all about the people that are dealing with your customers. It's all about the culture within your organization. If you are not guiding, if they are not letting, if you are not letting them guide you, then then all you're doing is you're running the ship. You're the rudder, but man, you're, nobody's listening and nobody's respecting you because that's the other side of it too. It's all about the respect side too. And yeah. if you're not getting the respect from your from your followers, then you're you're really nowhere if you're not listening to them. So, so let, let's dig a little bit deeper um, on, on Doug. Here's my belief, not the truth. Here's my belief. My belief is that the people who really succeed, and by that I don't just mean big bank account and uh, a Rolls Royce. I mean, you know, really succeed, have a depth of fulfillment and all of that. Um, I believe they're obsessed. I think there's something they're obsessed with. There's something that they can't help but, you know, it comes on the radio, they have to listen to it. There's a podcast about it, they have to listen to it. There's a TV show about it, they have to watch it. There's a magazine article, they have to read it. They, they, there's a conversation going on at a social event that seems like it's not appropriate, but they're going to be in there like a dirty <laughs> shirt. What are you obsessed with, Doug? What's your obsession? I, you know, I, I go back to when I was a little kid and I can remember having conversations with my mom and with my dad about this. And the conversation was always, I may not have succeeded, but man, I tried so hard, you know, and I just keep having those words go all, over and over in my head. I am trying, I am trying, I'm trying. Now, I, I maybe, you know, I, I, what's the, what's the uh, Yoda said, no try, do, no try or something like this. Stop, <laughs> stop trying, do. Yeah, there I, is I do. no try, only do. Uh, there's only no try, only do. So for me, I really do, uh, I obsess about making sure that I give everything that I do my 100% effort. I don't, you know, we joke about it on my show all the time. I don't go into anything half-assed. I go full-assed or I don't go at all. So right. I, I really do feel like you got to give it everything you got. If you don't like what you do, do something else, you know. And you know what? You're bringing a whole bunch of other people down too. If you don't like what you do, you're making other people miserable. So get out of their face. So for me, it really is about I am obsessed with making sure that that it's a job well done. I love the pat on the back. You know, I really do. I love that ch checking the note, off, the checking the line off of the task list, crossing that goal off of my target. I love making my uh, making my goals happen. And even though I'm not a great goal setter and I know that's probably not a great thing from a leadership perspective, not to be a great goal setter. 
But I do know that when I do set goals, I make them because for me, it's uh, I, I just don't want to give up. I don't want to give up. So inside of the, what is the obsession inside of that? I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to I'm happy to hear, you know, um, a good friend of both of ours, uh, Lolly Dascal. I had her on the phone with me maybe uh, about uh, maybe three or four weeks ago. And in, in a very quick order, she she picked up that what what is it that you're missing? What is it that you can't that's not clicking for you? I don't know what that is. I'm very open to, to having this analysis with you also because, <laughs> Dub, I, I think that that is the thing. I think most people in this world, and this is not a debate. This is just the reality of what I see. Most people can be successful, but they get in their own way. And there is something that, that consistently stands in my way to getting to that next level. Right. Now, what is, what is it though? I don't know. I would love to know what that is. I'm very open. I, you know, I don't know everything. I would love to know what it is that gets in my way. Yeah. And I think that, that you know, that that's an important question for, for every leader. And I think that leaders who succeed, um, on paper, uh, but often feel like they haven't fully succeeded, have not been willing to ask that question. They're not willing to ask, what will it take for me to get to that next level? What's, what is it going to take for me to go there? Be and the part of the challenge is that their friends look at them and they say, oh, you know, I wish I was you. Right? Well, and that's, and that's just it. I mean, you hit it right on the head. What, from an outsider's perspective, someone, and I'm not saying this from an ego boost, I'm just saying this is the reality. Most outsiders looking at me might say, hey, that guy is successful at a lot of things. He see, he is always on fire. He's go, 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 go. And man, anything that he says that he's going to do, he does. And that is great. I want to have that reputation of as course. the guy that's always going to come through. In my mind, though, I feel like, why haven't I gone to the next level? What is that next level? I don't even know what that next level is, but why? There's something that's that's itching me that I can't quite get to the scratch. Right. And yeah, I'm willing to, to, to be vulnerable enough to say, I don't know what that is. I wish I could get there. And that was the thing that Lolly and I were talking about on the phone is I, I just don't know what I'm not clicking on. There is something and Maybe it's a coach that's going to get me there. Maybe it is a psychologist that is going to get me there. Maybe it's a talk show host that's going to get me there. I, I don't right. know, but I know that there is something that's going to help get me to that next level. But, you know, it's, it's great that you have that hunger. I mean, that's a lot of the work that I do and the one-on-one -on -one work that I do with my clients. It is, it's like get underneath that because we all, as I said, I think that those who are truly successful – have an obsession there's something that drives them that, that something that often as you said that they can't pin down but it's underneath that what it is is that that drives them that gets them up in the morning you know and it's and it's vitally important what would you can say I, can, I, can i say can i say this though i want to yeah. i want to add to it just for a second the the fact that there is an itch that needs to be scratched I don't want that to be confused, not by your listening audience, but even by myself. I don't want that to be confused with a with a level of insecurity. I'm a very secure person. I feel confident in my capabilities. It is something about that level that I'm trying to get to that I don't know where it is. I can't even necessarily define what that success means to me, other than I know that I want to, you know, leave this world a happier place than before I got here. But there is there. It's not an insecurity because I, I have the confidence. Um, but it, it, there is something. So anyway, I just I just wanted to define well, that I, because I think it's an important statement that you've made, Doug. Because all too often, and I actually did a sh one of my shows about this, one of my uh, Facebook broadcasts about about this is the way we perceive people is often incomplete. We see people as a single faceted being and nobody is a single faceted right. being. Right. And, and so you can be confident, you can be very secure in yourself. That doesn't mean that you don't question. In fact, if you're truly successful, you are constantly questioning. You're always looking at that because there's no room for complacency. So the people I know who are outstandingly successful they don't go, oh, I made it. The ones who I know who are successful and about to fail and you can see them on the brink of it, those are the ones who, who are saying, I'm, I'm all that in a bag of, bag of chips. Right. What they really right. are is that all in a bag of shit. I mean, it's just not going to last. <laughs> yeah. So so I don't see even the question as a 
concept of insecurity. I see it as the security, the, the courage to be willing to ask and say, what is it that next level? Because, you know, I've got the Mercedes parked outside. I've got the floating million dollars available to me, whatever it might be for that person. Right, um, right. But I want to know what's at that next level for me. What is it that calls to me? And that's not an insecurity at all. That is, to me, courageous and secure enough to say, you know what? I ain't there. And I think yeah. that that's that's something that we've really got to make a point of having people get right here on this show. Um, because that's that piece around authenticity again that, that's vital. So it's thanks for bringing it back because I think it, it does need to be clarified and we've done that. Well, and I think I think that that's probably a part of why your show is successful, why my show is successful. It's because you don't, you know, when have you, how many questions did you send me before this interview? I don't recall getting a list of questions that you're oh, going to we ask me. Because <laughs> we don't. How many questions did I send you before you came on my show? The same amount. Exactly. I, you know, it's like I'm just going to have a conversation with you, and if we can forget for a moment that you have thousands of people that are listening, and it's just a conversation through Skype, as we were going to be sitting in a bar having a pint, the same yep. thing. I think that that's what makes for a great conversation. I think that, that that's what makes for a successful show. So again, hats off to you for being able to create that environment of just having a conversation, which is the reality of podcasting, of successful podcasts nowadays. Of course, absolutely. So in, in, the, in the framework of your book and, and the framework of what it is you speak about, because you do speak, um, in the context of what you speak about what's in the book, you know, I asked you about C-suite individuals. Let's flip it a moment and go to entrepreneurs. Um, is there something in there that you think, you know, that, that uh, it's my language, but something in there that you think entrepreneurs need to be punched in the face with that they just don't get enough, they don't grasp deep enough in the context of what it is you're saying in the book and what you say from, your, from the stage as a speaker? Well, especially as a new entrepreneur, I think that the problem is that we're so eager to have anybody as our client because they have green that we're willing to do anything to have them as a client. And I would suggest to people that uh, to be a little bit more selective with the people that you choose as clients because it's not everyone that has money that should be a client of yours. It's the people that you choose to. So if you go at this from the beginning with the attitude of I'm independently wealthy and don't need the money. Certainly, I understand that you do need the money and that you have to pay your bills. I have sacrificed many clients along the way because I don't feel like we have a relationship that fits. In corporate America, it ne isn't necessarily up to you who the clients of that company are going to be, especially if it's a lar large organization. As an entrepreneur, I would tell you, align yourself with people that you can have a relationship with. If you feel like you're sacrificing with your relationships too much, your, your business is not going to succeed. So if there's any piece of advice that I could give to entrepreneurs that are out there, such as myself, mm -hmm. it would be do re, re, have business and do business with the people that relate to you and you relate to the best. And, and I get that. And I'm going to challenge you on that because, sure. um, you know, I think what you said is important. Uh, you know, you work inside the corporate America. You know, the, the company says you're going to work with this client. The client sucks. You got to do it. Yes, you jump. Right. Okay, I get that. Um, and the philosophy of, well, you're an entrepreneur, you get to pick your clients, fully, absolutely, totally in agreement with it. But if you're a new entrepreneur, and there are some of those who are our listeners and our viewers who are going, I got to pay the freaking rent, mate. Right. I, I got to pay the rent. I got to, you know, I got to keep a head over my family. I got to put food in the, in the bellies of my family. And you're telling me to act like I'm independently wealthy? I got to take the client. Well, okay. So, you know, I always tell people as they bring me situations that you're bringing me in at the wrong part of the problem. You know, if you were to tell me that, hey, I got to pay the rent, I would say maybe you left your job too early. <laughs> or, right. or maybe, maybe you're 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 working under a um, uh, over under um, a, a set of circumstances that I would not have put myself in to begin with. So, okay, so you got to pay the bills. So take the client, understand that this is a temporary client, and move on. Um, my my uh, my wife, who is an event planner, um, in the beginning of her event planning stages, took on a few clients that she probably shouldn't have taken on because they are, you know, who are the who are your clients that give you the most had headache? and hassle the ones that pay you the least of unfortunately so sometimes you take on in her case she took on some clients that she probably wishes she had, she shouldn't take on 
But you know what? She, it helped pay the bills, and that was great. But when you always learn a lesson. If you're going to take on a client that you don't want and you don't feel is a good client, at least have the knowledge to know this is temporary, and I'm going to learn a really good lesson here, and i got to get done with this client. But I, but I think that that's the piece that I want people to grasp is that, that yeah, there are situations, circumstances where you go, okay, i I, I got to suck it. it up, and I'm going to do it, and I don't want to do it. At the same time, not thinking that that's the way it has to go from here on in. Well, so, I tell everybody, don't polarize everything that I say. Just because I say, well, choose every client that you have. Yeah, ultimately, that's my goal. You know, as, a, as, a, as a DJ in that world, in my entertainment world, um, at this point in my career, if somebody calls me and says, just from a dollar perspective, I'm going to give you $300 to do your job, I'm going to say, well, okay, which toe do you want of mine? My left toe or my right toe? Because I'm not giving you anything else. I'm not showing up at your gig for 300 bucks. Right. But in my, in my speaking world, which is, you know, in its infancy, just a few years old, if somebody were to say to me, I'm going to do, I have $300 to give you as a budget, I might think, okay, well, where do you want me to be and, and how quickly can I get there? Or it might be, let me understand how the value of what I can do can, can uh, be interpreted by your organization. I'm going to provide another, another level of service or there's going to be something that I'm going to do or you're going to provide that's going to be different at that price point. I have to make some, some uh, concessions in my speaking world because I'm brand new at it. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is that I think it's important to keep in mind that you, you, as you get better, you're allowed to be pickier. Um, totally right. To stay in that that lack mentality. But it's also so that you're not, you know, I don't mm -hmm. say it in a rude way, which toe do you want, my left toe or my right toe? I just say it doesn't appear from your budget that I'm going to be the right fit for you. Right. I'm happy to make some recommendations. I'm happy to share with you at least a little bit of a, you know, you, you have to be nice in the process of doing that. There we too. go. That's it. You're still, so it's not <laughs> about being an asshole. It's still be nice. Right, even if, right, right. So, so <clears throat> and this is the thing that, I, you know, I want to jump in with is that, um, it's a different context of nice. So I'm going to say that up front because we've discussed here a very different context of nice. But in the generalized context of nice, my, my response is nice guys are assholes. And the reason I say that is because nice guys are usually freaking liars. They're right. too busy right. being nice and not trying to offend anybody rather than being genuine, which is the context we talked about, rather than being integral. They go, oh, yeah, you know, you know. Uh, and I, I said, if you want to meet the ultimate in nice guys as a nation, go to Thailand. I, I renamed Thailand as Lyland uh, because, you know, they're always nice and they always say, yes, could you do this for me? Yes. Can you do it by tonight? Yes. And two days later, you don't have it because they don't know how to say no. They're busy being nice. That's a different context. And, it, and so I think that one of the important things is to learn how to, to be the nice guy in the context that you've outlined here, Doug, and have integrity to be able to say no. Because no and nice are not exclusive. And I totally, think that that's totally part correct. of the generalized understanding. Yeah, and and one of the uh, one of the chapters in my book. While I should have called the chapter this, it's a uh, no is a sentence. <laughs> you know, it's like use the word no. I I'm not a yes man by right. by no degree am I a yes man. And oftentimes people will again, as you interpret uh, nice as a sign of weakness, sometimes interpret no, nice as a sign of saying yes and being a yes man. Right. Not the case. Not the case. So tell us, Doug, what is the one thing that you hope more than anything that they put on your gravestone? You know, it's funny you say that uh, because I, I have this conversation with I, my, my kids are 21 and 24 and I always remind them uh, when when there is a life event, two things I remind them, I have a lot of life insurance so you guys are going to be okay. <laughs> that's, number, that's number one. And the second thing is I want these words on my headstone. He made me laugh. That's it. He made me laugh. I, I, it has nothing to do with being nice necessarily. It has nothing why. to do with what? Tell I, us why you want that. I, I like. I love that. So tell us why that. Why you want I, that. I like that because I think that people that laugh are happy people. Happy people are genuine people. I, I think it's really hard. It, it's very conflicting in your brain to laugh and be in a bad mood. You know, I don't think your brain can can handle that at the same time. 
I have always been a very positive person. I always want to be a, a very positive person. And for me, uh, laughter is the thing that drives almost everything that I do in my life. It drives my show. It drives my business. It drives the entertainment that I do. As I'm up on stage, I'm always striving for what is the next thing, lesson that I can teach in a funny way to my audience. Right. So for, for me, it really is about it is about laughter. So he made me laugh are the words that I want on my tombstone. I like it. I like it a lot. Do you know who Hank Azaria is, the actor? Yeah, absolutely. He, uh, he's also a voiceover on The Simpsons for about, Simpsons for about five or six voices. And, and I saw him on Late Night with Stephen Colbert. <clears throat> and, you know, they were talking about all these voices he, he does. And, he, he's, you know, he's talking about one of the voices he does. And I was a voice actor many, many years ago, too. And uh, so he's talking about these voices he does. And he said... I like this voice, and I can't remember whose voice it was. He said, I like this voice. He goes, because when you talk in this voice, it's impossible to stay in a bad mood. It's yeah, impossible to stay negative. Right. And, and, and it's that, I think the, it, very often, you know this you know, from, from stage, uh, very often the comedian can make other people laugh, but how do you make yourself laugh? It is a very important piece because it is what keeps you you up. You know, um, you know. I, I was talking to somebody very recently uh, who is quite wealthy, who, who was saying to me that they, you know, they have this fear of being homeless. Mm -hmm. You know that, and you could see the weight of that. You know, it was like, wow, that's you know, and this is somebody who's not going. You can clearly tell they're not going right. to be homeless. Right, right. And I and I just said to them, "Do you do any voices?" And they go. Voices, what do you mean? I said, can you talk like this? And they go, what do you mean? I said, can you talk in a baby voice? And they go, no. And I said, <laughs> Never heard you do that, Dove. Well, like I said, I used to do voice acting. Right? I said, can you do another voice? And they're like, no. I said, can you do an accent? And they go, badly. And I go, okay, what bad accent can you do? So they were like doing a French accent, right? And so I said, okay, so say after me, I am so afraid. I may one day be homeless, you know? <laughs> and I might have to live underneath the bridge. <laughs> this person starts to crack up. And I said, now you say it in your accent. Well, my French isn't my accent, my French accent is as good as doesn't matter. <laughs> do it in yours. You didn't get the point. You didn't get the point. But All you're trying moment, to do is get them to like, think it's then, silly. <laughs> as she said these things, it started to break that state. Right, right. And it's a vitally important thing. So I actually really love that the thing you want on your gravestone <laughs> is... To, that he made he made us laugh. That's fantastic. So oh, thanks. as one final sort of thought here, tell us what it is that you would want to leave our audience with, what it is that you would want to have them go away as they drive in their car, as they sit at dinner or they sit across from somebody and go, you know, I listened to this show and this is the one thing that really hit me from what Doug shared. I got it. And, and I'll do it in a memorable way for them. Thank okay? you. Stop taking yourself so fucking seriously. Yes. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> this is life. We have one of these things. It's You're here. Make an impact. Have some fun. Get fucked up. Every once in a while, it's going to happen. The, your, your life is not going to be a straight line. It's going to be a completely jumbled mess. Take, take this, you know, stop taking yourself so fucking seriously and just live your life and enjoy it. And nobody gets out alive. <laughs> <laughs> nobody gets out alive. That's very... Very true. Very nobody, true. Nobody gets out of life. So, Doug, tell our tell our audience, tell our viewers, tell our listeners where they can find out more about you, potentially bringing you in as a speaker, or finding out about more about what it is that you offer, or about the book. Any of those above. Please let our audience know where they can find out more about you. Absolutely. So if you want to hire me as a speaker, just remember, I do not charge $300 and I'm not negotiating my fee down to $300. So if you want to hire me as a speaker, call my agent. Okay. Uh, anyway, if you want to get in touch with me, just uh, reach out to me. Um, my website is Doug. Uh, let's see. What is my website? DougSandler.com. Uh, if you want to listen to our podcast, it's the nice guys on business. Um, and, uh, that's it. I mean, all my contact information is on my website. So just Doug is the easiest spot to get so to me. Doug Sandler.com to find out about you, find out about the book, find out about your speaking. You can also tell us where we can find you on Twitter. Uh, at DJ Doug, that is the easiest spot to reach at me. DJ and I, I am a Twitter <laughs> fiend. So if you're on Twitter, I would love to connect with you there. Please feel free. If you're a leader out there and you want to come on my show, 
uh, please get in touch with me. I'd love to have you on the show. If uh, if Dove says you're a good guy, then I would agree with that too. <laughs> you may not be nice in the way we, <laughs> we framed it before, but you might be nice in the genuine sense. True, it's been great true. having you here, Doug. I've really enjoyed our chat. It's been fabulous. And, and I really want to thank you for your for your openness, for your vulnerability, for your real genuine sharing. Thanks for being the new version of nice. And that's what I'm going to rephrase it as the new version of nice, as opposed to the N-I-C-E we referred to earlier. Uh, so it's been great having you here. Again, thank you. And remember, you can find Doug at DougSendler.com, as of course we will post uh, his URL for you. But you can find it, and you can also find him on Twitter at DJ Doug. We'll post all of that for you anyway. And I want to make sure that we thank you for joining us and tuning in. Remember, the research consistently shows that the companies that stay at the top are the ones that are on purpose. They're purpose-driven. And they are true. if you're truly serious about getting absolute clarity, laser beam clarity about your company's purpose and building a culture that is fiercely loyal and with highly engaged leaders, reach out to me. My name is Darv Barron at Full. MontyLeadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills for today's good leaders who are committed to becoming great leaders of tomorrow while serving their people and the bottom line. FullMontyLeadership.com, providing the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there because you can't outsource authenticity. Remember to also stop by matrix.fullmontyleadership.com, matrix like the movie, and get your authentic leadership matrix assessment tool absolutely free, valued at $197. Get over there just as a gift for you tuning in today. Until next time, this is Dov Barron, Full Monty Leadership, saying stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about whether you're truly N-I-C-E or whether you are nice because as Doug says, nice guys and gals finish first in business. Till next time, this is Dove Baron and I am out.